It is such a tremendous honor for all of us to have Senator Snow here at Politics and Prose. Um, and I have to say, Senator, given the subject of this book, your timing is quite impeccable. Uh, as many of you know, uh, the confidence in our political institutions is now, unfortunately, at an all-time low. So Senator Snow's message is, is a, really a clarion call to lawmakers and one that we hope they will not only hear but heed. Uh, Senator Snow, I think everybody in this audience and certainly in Washington is aware, was a highly respected member of Congress for 34 years, including uh, three terms in the Senate, until she announced late last year that she was not, I don't know if it was it late, but it was last year, that she was not seeking re-election. Um, she's a tough-minded Republican from Maine. She won respect on both sides of the aisle for her independence, integrity, efforts at bipartisanship, and appreciation of the now almost completely extinct art of compromise. I was going to say dying, but, you know, that might be too generous. Um, especially on some of the most complex challenges facing, facing our country, from prescription drug care to environmental uh, regulation and um, uh, issues to um, bipartisan health care reform. But by the end of 2012, she'd had enough of the toxic tone and partisan gridlock of Washington and decided to leave Congress, not to abandon her fight at all, but to continue it outside of elective office. The result, uh, thankfully for all of us, is not only this wonderful book, but also her work for the Bipartisan Policy Center, which aims to galvanize citizens to demand more from their representatives than the rigid ideology and vitriolic name-calling too often seen on Capitol Hill these days. And you should know that a portion of uh, the proceeds from this book will be going to uh, help the Bipartisan, Bipartisan Policy Center. Also keep in mind that Fighting for Common Ground is not simply a memoir, although it is a political memoir, and it's not simply a chronicle of her experiences in Congress, although there's a tremendous amount of wonderful uh, anecdotal information and, and uh, insight into her experiences. It's also prescriptive. It offers specific and realistic remedies to our nation's political ills that can begin to undo the stalemate and move our political and legislative process uh, forward and in the right direction. Um, Senator Snow, we were talking earlier uh, about the fact that uh, Politics and Prose is an independent bookstore. It's something we're very proud of. We're very proud of ourselves as a bookstore, but we often say that we're more than a bookstore. And we're really serious about our mission of building community. And one of the ways we do, do that is by, by serving as a gathering spot for people in our community and as a marketplace for ideas. And indeed, this event, which is one of 475 uh, author events we host each year, reflects our determination to provide a forum for civic, and I want to emphasize civil, discourse about the salient issues of the day. Uh, and for all of these reasons, I mean, because you are such a, um, an exhibit of what we're talking about and of what this nation so desperately needs, and you've been such a champion for exactly those values, we are so honored to have you. Uh, we hope you feel very at home here, and you know you always are welcome on our stage. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa, very, very much uh, uh, for that very gracious and generous introduction. I'm the one that's honored to, to be here today. Um, I, first, I want to thank you, Lisa, for your many years of public service as well, both as a speechwriter. She knows a lot about book writing as well, and now she's into book selling along with Bradley. And I just want to congratulate you and all that you have done to ensconce this legendary uh, bookstore uh, that, has, uh, that has been around almost as long as I have in Washington. <laughs> yeah, I'm a little bit older. Yeah, I'm a little bit older. But I just want to thank you for the privilege of, of being here today. I know uh, certainly we've had a lot of emphasis on the politics, so it's also great to have uh, a little bit of emphasis as well on the pros. Uh, although I don't know that I can say that about my book. Uh, you can find it also. <laughs> but I just uh, want to say that uh, I'm just delighted to be here with all of you, and I will heed the advice of what a very good friend once told me. Olympia, a great speech is one that has a very good beginning, a very good ending, which it kept very close together. <laughs> so that's what I'm going to try to do today, because I'd like to answer many of your questions. There's a lot to do, and the other part about this, uh, being an independent bookstore, which I marvel, I think that is so important to preserve our bookstores uh, here uh, in, in America um, as independent bookstores. And then uh, secondly, having the ability to have this conversation. 
because Lisa is so right about the very fact uh, there are very few places where you can have a give and take in conversation, have a refuge from all the passions and the polarization of politics, and just have a discussion on the basic issues that are facing our country. Um, as Lisa mentioned, I've been in public service now in, in the legislative branch of government for 40 years. So um, I'm having a surreal experience because this is my first year after 40 years of no longer being part of the legislative branch of government, uh, 34 of which were in the House of Representatives, 16 years, and of course 18 years uh, in the United States Senate. And yes, a little more than a year ago, um, I surprised, uh, I know the political establishment and certainly my constituents in Maine, and even me, uh, <laughs> for making this decision about not seeking a fourth term to the United States Senate. In fact, you know, it didn't. It was in a short period of time when I came to the regrettable conclusion uh, that the current polarization and partisanship would not be diminished in, in the short term. And that that polarization was precisely what was preventing us from tackling the monumental problems at this time of great consequence to our country. But I'd like to what Lisa, emph Lisa emphasized, and that is, I wasn't abandoning or leaving the fight. I was just taking the fight in a different direction. I was leaving the United States Senate. And it wasn't because I no longer loved the institution or that I no longer believed in its potential, but precisely because I do. I am very passionate, you know, about changing the tenor uh, in the uh, political discourse today, and most certainly uh, in Washington, in Congress, because inevitably, uh, if you don't change it there, you can't move the country forward. And I made this decision, and it was a surprise, as I said, to me as well. And having reached this uh, conclusion, I think it surprised me even more than my decision uh, not to run for re-election was to write a book about it. And I had been approached um, about, you know, talking about my experiences in Congress, what had changed, and what we can do about it. Because as I traveled, not only my state, but my country, I heard from so many people who expressed their, you know, their anger, their frustration, their fear, their alarm, about what was transpiring in Washington, the inability to come together just to make decisions even on the most minor issues, let alone on the consequential one. But they asked, you know, is it ever going to change? And I began to ponder that question. Was it ever going to change? And that's when I came uh, to the sad conclusion that it might not unless we do something about changing it. And I know it can be different, uh, it doesn't have to be this way, and it hasn't always been this way. So I decided to write a book uh, in a very short, concentrated period of time. And I couldn't help but remember what somebody once said about writing books. It's not fun to write a book, it's fun to have written a book. Uh, because, believe me, about the experience, I now appreciate those who do this uh, for a living. But the timing was specific and not coincidental. Uh, and that's why it was an ambitious time frame to conclude this book on fighting for common ground. Because we figured if we're going to have an impact, you know, on the congressional process, uh, it has to be released at this point in the time frame in Congress. This is the point at which between January into the fall, and perhaps no later than Thanksgiving, um, that decisions, fundamental decisions, will either be made or they won't be. This is where the groundwork is laid for whatever will be accomplished in this Congress. Because, after all, once you get closer and closer to an election year, and especially in this environment when it's become a perpetual campaign, nothing really ever gets done, regrettably. And so we wanted the timing of this book to be released at this point so we can have this discussion across the country about what we can do about it. Because it wasn't enough just to write the book, we wanted to make sure that we can also give examples of, of what can be done uh, to solve this problem in real time. 
For the 34 years that I served in both the House and Senate, I have seen people on both sides of the political aisle come together, even with you know, wide-ranging differences on politics and in philosophy, when they're determined to solve a problem. You know, I have witnessed that bipartisan, bipartisanship has led to great achievements and to great accomplishments. I think about, you know, in 1981, you know, after the election of President Reagan, which was a confluence of tumultuous events that were occurring uh, in America, both internationally with the Iranian hostage crisis and, of course, uh, we had domestic uh, events uh, such as the gas crisis as well as um, the economic problems that imperiled our well-being from double-digit inflation, double-digit un unemployment, and, of course, a prime interest rate of 20 and 21 percent. So President Reagan understood that if anything was to be accomplished, that he was going to have to achieve agreements with the Democratic House of Representatives. He had a Republican Senate as a result of the 1980 election, but it had overwhelmingly Democratic House. And he built a coalition, and I was part of that coalition of uh, moderate to liberal Republicans and moderate to conservative Democrats, and built a strong coalition to engineer his economic recovery plan. If you look at President Bush 41, uh, he had to build an international coalition to repel Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. He went on to broker a budget agreement in the midst of a recession, for which he eventually you know, paid a high political price. He lost that election because of the tax increases that were included in that agreement. President Clinton uh, understood the importance of certain issues, uh, such as, you know, balanced budgets and tax cuts and welfare reform that, you know, Republicans had now come in to the majority for the first time in almost 50 years. So he was going to have to work with a Republican Congress uh, after the 1994 election. And he fo focused on those critical issues. And I well remember um, former President Reagan said, in response to President Clinton's um, State of the Union address when he was talking about welfare reform and tax cuts and balanced budgets, uh, in great admiration, he said, well, that's, you know, an act of grand larceny because he was, he was talking about Republican issues, but he understood that you have to stake out positions between his party, the Democratic Party, and the Republicans who controlled uh, the Congress. <clears throat> and what was the net result? We had four years, we had four years of balanced budgets and ultimately surpluses that were produced as a result of that collaboration and that cooperation. In 2001, um, I co-chaired the Senate Centrist Coalition along with John Bro, who at that time was a Democratic senator from Louisiana, and we decided uh, that we would invite um, the Senate Majority Leader Trent Lott and Senator Daschle, the Minority Leader, to a meeting of our centrist coalition over which a third of the Senate uh, showed up, equally divided between Republicans and Democrats, uh, because this was in the aftermath of the Bush-Gore decision that was handed down by the Supreme Court, as well as the Senate was now evenly divided between Republicans and Democrats. And in fact, uh, then Vice President Cheney had to break the tie uh, in the United States Senate. And we were concerned that um, if we lost the bipartisanship that was so essential to moving the legislative agenda, that we wouldn't be able to accomplish any of the major issues uh, that were on the, on the docket for that uh, legislative session. And in fact, uh, President Bush, 43, was able to accomplish No Child Left Behind because of his working with the late Senator Ted Kennedy. The same was true on the tax cuts in May of 2001. We were again trying to forestall a recession that was just shortly before uh, the horrific events of September 11. The reason why I cite these examples is to illustrate how bipartisanship 
uh, is crucial in the legislative process in the overall relationships that exist between the executive and the legislative branch of government. Compromise, you know, isn't easy. It never is. But the fact of the matter is, there is no way to move legislation forward, and ultimately the country forward, if you're not willing to work with those with whom you disagree, reach out across the political aisle, and accept the fact that you don't have a monopoly on all the good ideas, that you won't get 100% of what you want. So those bipartisan relationships become essential, and they're a pivotal ingredient in the legislative process. In fact, somebody once said that bipartisanship is not a political theory, it is a political necessity. And people ask me every day and everywhere that I travel, why is it so difficult you know, to affect bipartisan solutions? Why is it so challenging uh, in this environment uh, that we find ourselves uh, that both sides cannot come together for the interests of the country? Well, of course, you'll have to read my book. But there are many, uh, many uh, reasons for uh, the point at which we are at today, you know, where the red states are getting redder and the blue states are getting bluer. But the point of it is, is that it's up to all of us. I remember what uh, the late Senator Warren Rudman once said. He said, politics is too important to be left to the politicians. And in so many ways that that's true. It's up to all of us as citizens. So the question is, how do we get Congress back on track? Well, first of all, we have to begin to reward bipartisanship and compromise and consensus building in the political process today. And we have to penalize, frankly, those who don't engage in working across the political aisle. I personally have started a PAC to support consensus building candidates. It's called olympiaslist.org, but it is, it is the reason why we need to back candidates who are willing to work on a bipartisan basis. And so you obviously have to support them in elections and demand and insist on that bipartisanship because there is no other way. We get the government, we demand. And if we want government to work, then literally the tools are at our fingertips. And that means the social media, the online technology, for example, to use the same means of mass mobilization as those who have fanned the flames of polarization. I hope to build a national following through Olympia's List because I think that that is important on my, my Facebook and my website and Twitter because we want to do everything that we can uh, to carry this voice across the country and be able to create a critical mass of support among the American people in support of those who are willing uh, to work on a consensus-based approach in the United States Congress. And so that means that we all have to engage uh, in that process. My book will be a vital extension of this effort, but in the meantime, I also have worked uh, with the Bipartisan Policy Center, which is located here in Washington, uh, co-founded by four former majority leaders, two Democrats, Senator Mitchell and Senator Daschle, and two Republicans, Senator Dole and Senator Baker. And we have also created a commission on political reform within that bipartisan policy center so that we can evaluate the causes and the reasons and the consequences of this political divide. But we have now gone a step further and created Citizens for Political Reform so that we can create a grassroots effort as a catalyst for bridging the political divide. And this website was launched in conjunction with my book, and that's bipartisanpolicy.org. But the point is this. We need a counterweight 
to the extremes in our, you know, in our elections as well as in Congress today. Those who support the machinery of polarization and partisanship are very well organized, they're very well funded. And so we need countervailing voices. Uh, there are enough incentives in the system uh, for incendiary tactics and heated rhetoric, but we now need to change those incentives. And that's why it is important that we demand bipartisanship in Congress. We demand it of our candidates. We demand it of our elected officials. Make them accountable. And so through the Bipartisan Policy Center, we will have this website where people can, you know, log in and find what the common ground options are available on any particular issue that's pending before Congress, what can be done to break the stalemate, or what are the issues that's holding up the passage of the legislation and to use those common ground options and advocating the ideas among all lawmakers and championing those elected officials who are willing to bridge the political divide. And we have to use, you know, Facebook and Twitter and, uh, and all of the other means of social media and technology to make our officials accountable. And that means the president, it means leadership, and it means the rank-and-file lawmakers. Because I don't frankly see any other way and unless the American people are willing to engage. And trust me, I have been traveling the country, and I have heard literally to a person that I have met, what can we do about it? Because people are, like you, are deeply frustrated about the inability and the lack of capacity for the United States Congress to rise to the highest levels of lawmaking to address the fundamental problems facing this country. There's never was a time in our history where we didn't have the can-do spirit. And now, what's happened today, according to a recent study, we are at the highest level of polarization since the end of Reconstruction in 1879. But what does that say? That we are more polarized now than in any other moment, than in 134 years. Now, I have heard, you know, some of my you know, colleagues when I'm still in the Senate say, well, you know, it used to be worse. In the Senate, we had brawls, we had canings, and we had duels, you know. And I said, well, is that the standard? <laughs> Apparently it is. They haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> But that, you know, isn't that sad that we are aspiring to the lowest common denominator of lawmaking and legislating in order, you know, to make our points, but we do nothing to advance the best interests of this country. There's nothing more important than the best interests of this country. And certainly, it should take, you know, the, take the fore, be at the forefront, you know, of any, uh, ahead of any interests of any political party. And so that's why I was determined uh, to write this book, because we really do have to change this political culture before it becomes too entrenched. And that's my deep-seated concern. I mean, there are only so many cycles that you can go through and that ultimately people think this is, you know, of the way of political life. In the Senate, currently, you have, I think, at least half of the Senate have been elected since 2008. It wasn't too long ago that you would have, you know, almost half of the Senate having served at least three terms in the U.S. House, uh, in the U.S. Senate. And in the United States House, you know, of Representatives, um, more than half have served less than six years. So, what does that suggest? It suggests that they know of no other environment other than the current one, which is dysfunction and disharmony. That's why we have so much at stake at this point in time. And given the questions that remain, the outstanding issues that are on the legislative docket, 
we can't just simply wait for the next election. We must gravitate right now towards solutions and demand that our lawmakers are accountable to those issues. You saw how they respond to the air traffic controllers, right? right? I mean, there they did. I mean, they had the automatic cuts, and, you know, they, they recessed a week before the sequester took effect. But, you know, then they heard, you know, from their constituents when the furloughing of air traffic controllers uh, began, and I know I was sitting on one of those planes, and um, I heard what the pilots were saying. So if you're trapped in a plane with angry constituents idling on a tarmac, believe me, that will get your attention. And it did. So why can't we do the same when it comes to bipartisanship? When you, people ask me, well, why is it on universal background checks, when you have 90% support from the American people, it doesn't prevail? Because you know what? That 10% is vocal and well-organized. That's the point. We have to be vocal for bipartisanship and for compromise and consensus if we're going to move this country forward in the way that we deserve. Never in our history have we not had the can-do spirit. It has always been the lifeblood of this great country, and it still is. And so I didn't leave, you know, the fight in the Senate. I left to fight in another way. Now, my heritage is Greek, and on one side, it's Spartan. So <laughs> that gives you a measure of it. And that's the way it was in the Senate, and now I'm taking my message on the outside because I think it is so important uh, that we do everything we can uh, to turn this around. We, we can do it. You know, we can do it. I often think of uh, Justice Souter, who, and I'm paraphrasing what he said, he said, you know, all of the tough, case, you know, all of the tough cases in the Supreme Court are divisive. Um, he said, uh, not because, it's because it's replacing one set of values at odds with the other. Uh, you know, you, you know, it's between li liberty and order, freedom and security, uh, fairness and equality. He said, so the Constitution doesn't provide any simple decision uh, to settling these issues. It's up to the, the judges to make the tough choices, not among the good things or the many things that are evil in the but rather among the many and competing good things that the Constitution allows. But inherent in that observation is that reason and meaning and the reputational integrity of the process, you know, allows them to explain the very difficult decisions they have to make on the hard cases. And he con concluded by saying, he said, I know of no other way to make good on the aspirations of, of, that tells us who we are as a people and who we mean to be uh, as the people of the United States of America. And the same applies to the legislative process. You need passion, devotion, dedication, commitment, integrity, uh, and intelligence uh, to determine, you know, what is the best course in each of the issues that come before the Congress and ultimately before the American people. So I thank you all for being here, and I'll be glad to open it up to questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, when I was even running for re-election, so I thought in 2012, and I would meet with a number of groups, including Tea Party, and I would say, you know, there are 25 of us sitting around this table, okay, and you're absolute in your firm conviction that you have the right solution. Okay, so now you take 535 plus the President of the United States. How exactly do you solve a problem if you insist on only your solution? <laughs> Somebody has to give. And we have to respect differing ideas. I mean, that's what I loved about Congress, is having those fierce debates. I'm not trying to revive the golden era of bipartisanship. <clears throat> that never existed. But bipartisanship did, because there was a respect for the process, you know, and that ultimately, even in spite of those fierce differences, at the end of the day, you achieve an outcome. I mean, President Reagan and Speaker O'Neill, they had their strong differences, I can assure you, and all the way down the line, that wasn't the point. 
they knew that it was about the country and what we, they could accomplish for the country, and they figured out a way after they made their point and they moved and they made some concessions to one another, understanding what the other needed in order to make it happen. The same has to happen at the local level, and it's, it's really, a, really a travesty that it's all seeped into the process. <clears throat> and we have to restore civility and respect that people do have different ideas. Do you see a correlation between the increased costs of political campaigns and perhaps the growing demands of contributors that elected officials must fully support their positions in order to get contributions? Is that part of the legislative stalemate? And if so, does that mean that we should be looking at campaign finance reform as one way to um, create greater bipartisanship? Well, uh, campaign uh, finance reform is critical. It's an imperative. And I was part of the last process through McCain-Feingold, and it was my provision that was struck down in the Supreme Court, Citizens United. And unfortunately, they went another 100 years and unraveled precedent in case law to what we have today and calling corporations people and so on. I mean, frankly, the whole system has become so perverted. Um, and the, the multi-millions of dollars that are spent in outside, you know, issue so-called issue advocacy ads, which is what I was trying to get at through my provision, and actually it was sustained in the first court challenge, uh, but then we lost Sandra Day O'Connor and uh, didn't survive, obviously, the second challenge. But the point is, it's the millions of dollars that are being spent. I mean, for example, uh, you know, these ads that, you know, these outside groups sponsoring campaigns, 71% are there to attack, you know, people, not support anybody. So it's always the demonization of viewpoints of individuals. So by the time they get to Congress, there's a spillover. And that demonization continues to follow people into the Congress. It, you know, creates a divide. It solidifies that partisanship. And it's very hard to overcome. So yes, campaign finance reform is essential. The question is how you withstand constitutional scrutiny. I think the only way it can really work, if both sides are willing uh, to work together, and at least to figure out what is it that could work, withstand that scrutiny, understand that we have a vested interest as Republicans and Democrats uh, to change the existing process. I mean. 20 years ago, a little more than 20 years ago, they were spending 7 million outside ads, and this last election, 2012, was like, it was over uh, a half a billion dollars, and probably more with the presidential and everything else, but that's what was being spent, that's 75 times uh, the amount. Um, and it will only get worse, uh, frankly. So you're not only running against your opponent, you had to worry about that, but you're also running against these groups. You don't know who's gonna come in and attack you, and where they're gonna come from. You know, any part of the country can weigh in, for example, in Maine and decide that they're going to run ads, and they did, uh, and they do. I mean, that's what's happened now. So what happens to the legislative process? It's distracting. It's time-consuming because with every election, the growth and the cost of these campaigns uh, increases exponentially. So, yes, campaign finance reform is an absolute uh, imperative. Yes. Hi. Um, <clears throat> actually, I'll take off on that gentleman's question, yes. which was good. How do you ever expect the people who have already benefited from the corrupted system to be the ones who are going to correct it? It is, I mean, it's almost insane to expect them to, to, to try and go against their own interests. And the other thing is, I think what you're saying is right about compromise. It's sort of like telling Johnny to play nice when he gets in the sandbox and not throw sand at the other people. But on the other hand, there's some people in that sandbox that just shouldn't be there. And, <laughs> and, and that, I, I, I'm very I serious. Yeah, because one other thing, it's sort of like there are mafia wars and turf and all that kind of stuff, and it's sort of like saying to the mafia people, hey, you got to calm down and stop these turf wars. Right. And I have that same sense about our government that we might be better off that they can't get things done because it's only going to be for the special interests anyway. Well, 
uh, the the fair, there's no doubt there will always be some, you know, that would resist any kind of you know bipartisanship <clears throat> or willingness to work with the other side. That's true, uh, but there are a number of other lawmakers who are willing to engage in that process. Uh, but I think again, it's going to be a question of changing the way in which Congress now works. Frankly, it's going to take both sides. It's going to take both leaderships uh, to open up the process, to allow amendments to happen, go through the committees, have the rank and file involved, like what's, what's occurring in the Senate Judiciary on an immigration where they get 300 amendments and the process is working well. That is as it should be. So I think it is possible in the final analysis to reach the right conclusion. Uh, you know, and I've heard this argument from others who say, you know, it's, we're better off with no decisions, but in ultimately that won't be true on some of the questions we're facing and looming on the horizon, which is not so far off when it comes to entitlement reform. Uh, and even though the deficit's going down now currently, the annual deficit, the overall debt is going to grow substantially because we have 77 million Americans who will become retirees over the next 20 years, and that's going to, you know, dwarf these programs, both in Medicare and Social Security. So we'll have no choice, but the consequences will be that much greater. The alternatives and the solutions will be that much harsher uh, the fewer years we give it to be implemented and take place. That's the problem we're facing. And if you think about over the last few years, which issues have we addressed? I mean, that's what stunned me, to be honest with you, because I'm a problem solver. I'm a, you know, I want, at the end of the day, to solve a problem. I mean, that's the essence of public service. Well, we did something about health care, but the special interest yeah, still won. Yeah, health care. Well, you know, huh? the special interest, yeah, we should have had, you know, from my standpoint, because, you know, I ended up voting against it, but we needed to have both sides vested in it. I, I don't disagree with that. I think both sides, as was the case in stimulus, uh, frankly. Uh, both sides should have been involved. My side, you know, they locked down on that question, and ultimately only three of us as Republicans supported that stimulus. Um, and so the wheels came off early in that, in that in, well, when President uh, Barack Obama's first year, first month in office. Uh, regrettably. And, you know, it's uh, water over the dam now, but the question is, what do we do to repair this process so that we can get both sides to work? Um, I appreciate the effort that you're making vis-a-vis -vis public support of those who engage in bipartisan compromise. But I'm concerned that you're not placing, at least openly, any of the responsibility on the people who actually are responsible for compromising or not compromising, such as the leadership in Congress. Um, so I guess my question is, don't they have an obligation? We vote for those people, except unfortunately for the residents of <laughs> Washington, D.C., who I guess... You know, but um, that point again. The, yeah. Well, it's it, it's <laughs> not. I mean, it's a real issue, you know. And but but the people who are able to vote right. vote for representation for people to govern, right. not to be politicians. Mm -hmm. And I'm not hearing you talk about that responsibility to govern. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No, it is a responsibility, and that's why I was saying that using social media and online technology and any other means you know, of, you know, conveying your views and sentiment to Congress is to make the leadership accountable uh, and demand that accountability because you're absolutely right. I mean, the leadership really di determines and dictates the direction in the respective bodies. Uh, and they certainly do, you know, have a, an obligation to ensure uh, that we're addressing the key issues. I mean, ordinarily, you know, I guess say the you know the good old days, which reminds me, I should say, I m met this um, young man recently, uh, who's a professor at the University of Denver, and he used to work for Senator Dash when he was uh, the minority leader. And I saw him a couple of weeks ago at the, where I spoke at the University of Denver, and he said I was there between 1996 and 2002. He said in that in the course of that time we had impeachment, we had government shutdown. At impeachment, 
at 9-11, and um, I'm really surprised that I would be describing it as the good old days. <laughs> but you know, I mean, the point is, we rose above those differences or in those challenges. We came together at 9-11, you know, and impeachment overcame that we, you know, we acted, you know, with, in accordance with the traditions of the Senate, understanding that we had to preserve the integrity of the institution and, and, and hence the country. And the same was true with the government shutdown. We worked as a centrist coalition. We would put together a budget just to demonstrate that we could do it, a bipartisan budget that a few months later we put on the floor, almost passed, it fell, it fell short of a few votes and became the predicate for the balanced budget that would pass the following year that continued for the next three or four years, uh, four years uh, for producing surpluses. But you're absolutely right. The leadership is <clears throat> responsible. Now, I don't take away from them or diminish their responsibilities in upholding their obligations. And in fact, you know, it's up to, you know, when you think about the two political parties, I mean, the institutions are run through elected officials through the two political parties. And they have to be able to, to demonstrate that they have the capacity to solve the problems and make decisions for this country. And, you know, we have this perpetual failure of benign neglect, and ultimately, you know, people will find the third way. And so you're right, the leadership does. And I know that could be reflective of 80% of their caucuses, which is the case sometimes, and that's what happens. But they also have a responsibility to the overall institution in working through their differences. In the Senate, it's important for the majority leader, the minority leader, to talk to one another. I mean, they have to have that bridge of communication. Senator Lott and Senator Daschle had a direct line, so they could talk, a direct telephone line. You know, in the old days, a telephone. Uh, you know, pick up the phone. I used to say that to my staff. Pick up the phone. You know, because it sometimes can cut to the chase. You know, we have misunderstandings, mischaracterizations, uh, and misinterpretations of whatever the case may be. So, you're abs you know, you're absolutely right. They should be held accountable as well. The uh, question I have is around redistricting, gerrymandering, uh, mm -hmm. for the, the sake of bipartisanship. Let's say it's both a Democratic and Republican issue, uh, although most of the state uh, governments are controlled by Republicans. Uh, you mentioned in your... Uh, interview with Judy Woodruff uh, last month that there is an independent commission. There is a issue that's being discussed about establishing an independent commission uh, to deal with redistricting. And I wonder if the Bipartisan Policy Center is dealing with that and where they are. Yes, well, and that has to be enacted in the state level, but uh, what we're f focusing on as one of the four dimensions on this website is the state solutions to issues. And, you know, this is one that could be very prominent. Frankly, open primaries and independent redistricting commissions, which would have to go through the state legislatures. In some states, you know, like Maine has, has an open, you know, primary of sorts and an independent redistricting commission, probably a dozen states. Uh, currently, so it's getting state legislation to change that. But on our website, we're going to identify, you know, solutions that are occurring or what solutions you should be championing and getting lawmakers to champion. And frankly, legislatures are closer to home, so it's a much more doable process, frankly, uh, to get it done. And that includes open primaries because both of which will make more competitive seats in the in the final analysis. I mean. There were two studies that were done recently, 21 seats, one study said 21 seats were competitive out of 435, another said 35 seats out of 435. So clearly, much has changed, and therefore, that's the only way to rectify this problem. Uh, and open primaries would obviously sort of, I think, diminish just having the more, you know, extremes of the parties running, but rather having more moderate-based views, more centrist views, uh, that also, you know, can appeal to the broader population, you know, is going to be more responsive to the broader population. And that's important because I represented Maine, it was a blue state as a Republican, 
And the fact of the matter is, I mean, I heard many voices. I didn't hear one voice. I heard many voices. Uh, and I used to go back and say to my colleagues, well, who are you talking to? I know who I'm talking to. Why aren't we, you know, working on these issues? And that's because I had a diverse political constituency. That's why it's so important to open up primaries, to have, you know, independents being able to vote and having, and obviously, you know, averting all this gerrymandering that has uh, ensued in recent years. I'm a uh, freelance journalist and uh, currently a student down the road at American in, in the film program, and I'm interested in making uh, films about all aspects of civic engagement, uh, especially for youth, and I'm curious to know what you think about how the media contributed to the polarization. Well, I think what's happened um, with the 24-7, you know, media cycle, uh, plus also the evolution of the social media. I mean, it's just sort of, you know, there's an insatiable appetite for, you know, content and, and ratings. And unfortunately, uh, so often now what happens, at least from, you know, what I observed and experienced, that even before an issue even came to fruition or came to the floor of the Senate or came before a committee, if it ever did, already the opinions were formed and solidified, you know, on, on television and through, you know, you know, cable news. I always felt like I was defined through MSNBC and Fox News prison. You know, it was one way or the other, and there was no in-between, you know, not looking at the gray areas and trying to sort through you know, what are the differences and what are the issues that could bring people together or what separates them and what can we do about it? So that's the perpetual media cycle that has to, you know, be fed. And as a result, it makes it that much harder because people are going out there and they're using their talking points, their talking points, the messages, uh, and they repeat them over and over again. And ultimately, you have everybody locked down even before you have the opportunity to engage in any thoughtful debate. Oftentimes, issues that came to the floor, they were called messaging amendments. And so what's messaging? It's sending a message to your political base. Now, I understand that. I mean, you know, we all have to, you know, come through the political parties and political process, and I'm a Republican, I understand all that. Uh, but, you know, at some point you draw a line. And, but unfortunately, it's become all about that. And so people talk about their political message and talking points and message amendments and message positions and message legislation. And it all becomes, again, about locking down on both sides. That's why the Senate, it seemed like in, in recent years, was becoming more like a parliamentary system, that uh, voting in political blocks based on party positions. And it was becoming infinitely harder to sort of cross over. You had more party unity votes, more solidified on each side higher than ever, because you either got the far right or the far left positions as choices. So it became an all or nothing proposition and had no amendments, any way to bridge the divide, which really is the connector uh, to allow for that consensus. So yes, it does contribute uh, because of that, you know, 24 hour cycle. And people go and they feed their talking points and you know the drill and the formula and uh, that's exactly what happens. And then you add the issue advocacy groups that throw in the ads, and it further demonizes people's viewpoints, uh, and it's what we have today, and that's Do you contributed have any to it. advice for student journalists on how they can keep up their end of, you know, uh, keeping, encouraging well, democracy? Yeah, encouraging <laughs> democracy is, um, you know, one thing that I've noticed in uh, journalism today, so much is based on who's winning and who's losing. And oftentimes I would say to reporters, well, just tell me, give me the facts. Just give me the facts. You know, it's not about the winning or losing. Sometimes it's, it's got to be about the issue. What are the facts? And if they focus more on what the facts are about a given position or an issue or the problem that's impeding progress, you know, in Congress, then you can sort through it. But if it's all about whose strategy is winning or losing politically, you never get to the heart of the matter, which is the issue itself. And so they gloss over the, su the substance 
and focus on the politics. And that's why we're just in this virtual perpetual political cycle, uh, frankly, right now. So I would encourage you to, you know, listen to what are the facts of the issue, what's really the heart of the matter. And, you know, the politics ultimately will take care of itself. It's one thing to write about the politics, there's nothing wrong with that. But also is looking at does one side or the other or both have merit? You know, when they're making that argument or just saying, well, you know, do you think the, the idea that that guy did X, Y, and Z is, you know, going to work? Do you think he's going to win? And instead of saying, well, you know what, there's a problem with that, that amendment. Did you read it? You know, and people aren't reading. I mean, not reading the bills and the amendments and understanding what goes to the heart of the issues. And frankly, that's what it's all about. So I would encourage you in your reporting, in your future reporting, to look at that as well. Nothing generally is an all or nothing. And Thank I you. wish you good luck. Thank you. Thank you.